Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a key concept in mathematics and data analysis that is the Newton method, or alternatively known as the newton raphson method, that is a very flexible technique to find zeros of a polynomial function and its turning points, that is, local maxima and minima, as well as its inflection points. And it uses the logic of derivatives of a polynomial function of varying orders, so the first derivative, the second derivative, and the third derivative, and we'll approach it quite generally. We will input a polynomial function of an order 5. In principle, it works for any polynomial function or even for any function you can reasonably find derivatives of, but we stick with polynomials for simplicity. And here we have got a polynomial function of order 5, meaning that x to the power of 5 is the highest power we consider. And we have got x to the power of 5 to the power of 4, 3, 2, 1, as well as a constant, well, x to the power of 0, you can treat it as, as well as the coefficients in front of these powers. So here we have got this particular function represented um, as an example with those cells in yellow highlighting the coefficients. And now we have to figure out how to generally compute the coefficients of its derivatives. We'll need three derivatives to find zeros, turning points, and inflection points. So now here we have to remember this particular property of derivatives for power functions. If you have got a function x to the power of n, where n can be any real number, in our case we're only interested in integers though, when we find the derivative of it, we have to take this particular power, the exponent, in front, and then lower the exponent by 1. What it would mean is that if you take the derivative of this particular function, then you wouldn't have any coefficient for the power of 5, as all powers will decrease by 1, and for all other powers, you would refer to previous coefficients and multiply them by the respective powers they used to have in the previous function you have taken the derivative of. So for the derivative, first derivative of our original polynomial function, we would have the these particular coefficients. So for example, the 0 0.05, which used to be the coefficient for the fifth power, has been multiplied by 5 as per this property, and now is 0 0.25, that is the x to the power of 4 coefficient of the derivative. And we can represent it uh, mathematically in a general form over here. And it goes uh, on and on for all lower powers. In the similar fashion, we can do the second derivative. Here we see that as our initial function is of order 5, our first derivative is of one lower order, of order 4, this coefficient is 0, and the second derivative is of order 3, as both the fifth and the fourth power go away due to the fact that the exponent in differentiation goes one lower with each differentiation step. And finally, for the third derivative, we apply the same logic. And our third derivative would be a quadratic. The highest power would be 2, as we differentiated three times and lowered the highest power from 5 all the way down to 2. And if we study this particular coefficient, for example, the um, x coefficient for the third derivative, we can see how it evolved. It all started with the power 4 coefficient in our original function, then it got multiplied by 4 in the first derivative, then it got further multiplied by 3 in the second derivative, and finally it got multiplied by 2 in the third derivative, as it used to be an x squared coefficient in the second derivative. And that is how all the coefficients evolve for a polynomial function with further and further differentiation. Now let's figure out how to efficiently code the polynomial functions knowing their powers and their coefficients in Excel for a reasonably large range of x's. So here we have got x values from negative 3 to 3 with 
small increments of 0.1, so that we can plot a smooth polynomial function as well as its derivatives. And we're not going too crazy with our x values, as obviously we have got x to the power of 5, and this term is going to dominate if the absolute value of x is quite high. So that's why we stick with this quite narrow range, and we get quite small increments to figure out the behavior of the function in more detail. So for our original function, we need to calculate the sum of our coefficients. Here we have got them. We need to lock them, both row and column-wise, as we don't want them to change as we drag it across and down. We want to multiply it by the x value, and we don't want to lock x at all, as we do want it to change as we manipulate with this formula further. And then we need to raise it to the power of, well, the powers we have got over here. And these need to be locked just as the coefficients need to be. And now we can enforce this formula using shift control enter and figure out the value of the function for x equal to negative 3. Finally, we bottom right click this function all the way down and see how this function evolves for different values of x. And on the right hand side, we have got a nice smooth graph of this function plotted over here. And we can see the dynamics of the function from negative 3 to 3. And there are some uh, points of interest we can uh, look at over here. First of all, somewhere around negative 2.5, the function crosses the x-axis. That is a zero of the function that we can find using the function itself and its first derivative using the Newton's method. However, we can also spot two interesting turning points over here. A local maximum around x equals 0 0.5 approximately, and a local minimum somewhere around x equals to 2. To find those, we need the first derivative as well as the second derivative of our function. And we also have got a turning point at around x equals to 1, where the function changes its convexity. It used to be concave uh, before x equals to 1, as we can see uh, judging by the shape of the function, and it becomes convex uh, to the right-hand side of this inflection point. And we'll find the precise coordinates of all these four points of interest using uh, our uh, hero of the video today, the newton rapson method. So now let's apply the same procedure as we did for the original function to calculate its derivatives. And the only thing that we need to change are the coefficients over here. So we can drag this and enforce the formula for the first derivative. For the second derivative, as well as for the third derivative. And finally, we can bottom right click it all the way down and get the first derivative and the second derivative graphed alongside the function. And we see what we would expect to see from basic calculus logic that in our uh, suspicious turning points, the first derivative reaches its zeros, and at the inflection point where the convexity of the function changes, the second derivative in gray reaches its zero. And that's exactly why the Newton method is so handy here. Newton method allows you to find zeros of any function, knowing its value and the value of its derivative at a point. And it is an iterative method, as you can update the value of the x of the argument and reiterate the process over and over again, approaching your uh, zero of the function closer and closer. And obviously, if you want a zero of the function itself, we need it, the function uh, on its own as well as its first derivative. If we want turning points, we need zeros of the first derivative. So we need the first derivative here in the numerator and the second derivative in the denominator. And if we want the, the inflection points, then we want the zeros of the second derivative. So we need the second derivative in the numerator and the third derivative in the denominator. So let's figure that out. First of all, for the zero of the function itself, we can suspect it is somewhere around negative 2.5. So that would be our first x value for the iteration. Again, the method is not that sensitive to the starting values, but do uh, make effort to choose reasonably close values for better convergence. And here we can simply copy these two cells and paste them over here, figuring out the value of the function itself and its derivative. And now we apply the Newton method 
updating the x value by subtracting the ratio between the function and its first derivative. This is our updated x value, and we can finally drag this down and bottom left click that throughout the iterations. And we can see that in two iterations, we have, uh, for all intents and purposes, achieved our zero of the function. And we can see that the zero of the original function corresponds to the value of x of negative 2.35. Or if we want better precision, we can increase the number of decimal places here, verify that x um, is minus 2.346914, and that the value of the function is indeed uh, almost zero up to six uh, digits, up to six decimal places. So this is how fast, uh, in terms of convergence, the newton rathson method is. What about the turning points of the function? Well, to find those, we need to find the zeros of the first derivative. To do that, let's start first with the local maximum, which is, as we suspect, um, around 0 0.5 in terms of the x value. And here we copy these three cells, f of x, f dash of x, the first derivative, and, and f dash dash of x, the second derivative. We paste them over here and apply the Newton method but for the first derivative, we want the zero of this particular function. So we update x by subtracting the value of f dash of x over the second derivative f dash dash of x. And now we can drag this one row down and bottom right click all the way down over here to get our local maximum at 0.34. We can verify that it's indeed the local maximum either graphically, looking at the chart, or by looking at the second derivative and figuring out that the function is indeed concave at this point, meaning that the uh, turning point is indeed a local maximum. And we can also increase the number of decimal places over here to um, see what is the more precise representation of the local maximum point we have found. For the local minimum point, we need to simply tweak our starting values. We see that our local minimum is around x equals to 1.5. So if we input 1.5 here, we have now arrived at our local minimum. Uh, and it's uh, verified it's indeed a minimum, as the second derivative is positive at this point, And it is uh, a convex function in terms of uh, its value at this particular point. So a turning point is a local minimum. And we can see the precise values of the x value, our uh, local minimum value of x at this point, as well as the value of the function at this point. And finally, for our inflection point, that is around x equals to 1-ish, we need our four functional values over here. So let's start with an x of 1.5 as well and get those four values down the line. And now apply the Newton method to the second derivative, subtract the second derivative over the third derivative, drag this all calculation one cell down, and bottom left click it all the way down like that. And we can verify that the inflection point is indeed around one, more precisely at 1.04, or even more precisely at 1.04 to 757. We can again see how close to zero those iterations are for all three applications of the Newton method we have um, done today. And we can see how well it corresponds to the graphs over here. And that's all there is for the application of newton rathson method in Excel to find zeros, turning points, and inflection points of a polynomial function. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.